ladies and gentlemen. We've had enough silly neuro games. It's time to learn. And we're going to learn a little bit about ZVP. ZVP is one heck of a matchup. I think of the various Zerg matchups, ZVP is the most mysterious because Protoss has a lot of very different tech options and different builds, and you really have to think about what you're doing. A lot of the other stuff, it kind of just ends up being bashing roaches into the situation, or Hydrobane. But ZVP is a, a tricky one. So let's see what Raynor does, because Raynor is an up-and-comer. He's a young man, and he's super fast. He zooms around, and he's really crisp with his macro. He's not like super reliant on big timings and all ends and stuff like that. Actually, I'm gonna take off the the donation goal for now. Dupe, dupe, dupe. Burp, 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 burp. Burp, 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 burp. Got him. Got him. Okay. So we can have this fancy nameplate with the supply. Heck yes. Heck yes. All right. Zerg versus Protoss, how does it work? We have a very strong Zerg bias in this stream. I am a Zerg player. We can also think about what Neeb is doing as well. We're gonna watch both players. The first decision of note is going for the 16 hatch. So he's getting the hatch down just a little bit earlier. It gets the creep out sooner and reduces the chance that you're gonna get the base blocked. Looks like Neeb is gonna go for Gate Nexus Cyber, if I had to guess, that would be the standard thing. Neeb tends to play in a very standard, straight up macro style. He doesn't cheese too much, but when he does, whew, it's, it's cheese. Yep. Gate Nexus Cyber. Just a super safe, normal build. Rainer does something that not every Zerg does at a high level, which is send both Overlords across the map. A lot of players will just send one and try to get the scouting they need with that one overlord. Because Phoenix is a super common opening for Protoss and people get really upset when two of their overlords get shot down by a Phoenix. So he made two lings to clear away the probe and try and get this space down. A little bit of a, a corner that was cut there. Some people go for four lings. The difference between the two is not really going to be that crucial for you. Pulled two workers off of gas after Ling speed. He's got two queens, and I want to see the overlord timing. Okay, looks like he made an overlord at 32. And then a queen. And he hasn't made more than these two Lings. So he's trying to solve his problems with just the two Lings and two queens. Building spores, or just running away. Nice. So he didn't lose a drone there. That's super important. This first Adept can be really lethal. I would say if it gets two or more kills by itself and escapes, that's almost a game-winning play for the Protoss, assuming they're making probes at home behind it. Which is a pretty big assumption in some cases. Okay, so he's going for Phoenix, taking two gases at the normal time. Three minutes 30 would be the standard normal time. You can't always say, oh, the gases are late, the Protoss is gonna all in especially if you're in a middle or a lower league. But the higher you get in league, the more inferences you can make about the scouting that you receive. So he can say, all right, Neeb could have spent this 150 minerals on an additional gateway, so I'm gonna drone a little bit harder. That would be my guess there. He's going for an Oracle after the Phoenix. Oracle and Phoenix are kind of like the Batman and Robin of Protoss early game. They're just really good at swinging around the rooftops and stuff and figuring out what's going on and sometimes getting some damage in. So he went for spores at around 340. One spore in the main first. He delayed the spore here because there are two queens that are in the way of an oracle if it were to zoom over. He's getting a lair just before four minutes. And I believe he put back on gas at 330. That would be my guess. That would be my guess. Let's see. Yep, right at 3.30. Cool. 
So these six slings are going to run around. It's a really common move for them to bump the wall and see what's happening. He doesn't need to do that because this overlord is telling him what's up here. So he's droning away, making another queen. Basically, after he spends his larva into drones, he's going to use excess minerals into overlords and queens. So he's not supply blocked at all. You should be aware that as the phoenix is killing your overlords, you're going to have to make some extra ones. It's fine. So he has two gateways and a stargate, and he's adding on one more gateway and one more stargate to take a third base. So this approach is right in the territory of the absolute most greedy way Protoss can play, which is also the least dangerous, right? Super awesome Overlord Scout. So he kept that second Overlord from the beginning of the game up here. And the Phoenix didn't find it. And then he just sent it in and he got this key read. Which gives him tons of time to prepare. And it really snaps the surprise value. This is a really common Protoss build these days. Just going for fast double Stargate Phoenix. It doesn't fully commit the Protoss to air. They can go for ground with their third base of economy. If you think about it. In the stepwise process, this was one base economy of Adepts, some Gateways, and Phoenix Oracle. And then as the second base is kicking in, they're using that money to go double Stargate Phoenix and afford a third base. And then with the third base, Protoss can go air or go ground. You have to find out which one it's going to be. So we see third base here. Boom. So what does Rainer do? One thing that I've noticed from his play is he doesn't transfer his probes or his uh, drones, sorry, very often between his bases. This stuck out to me. I was watching one of his games just in my spare time to kind of learn some Zerg. Sometimes I'll just watch a replay from the Zerg's POV and just not really think about it too much, just see the game flow and whatnot. But one thing that stood out was Almost all of his hatches, almost all the time, are just rallied to the current mineral patch. And as it overflows with mineral income, like he has 19 here, he takes a gas and then fills it. This base is filling up, so he has a gas and he makes a structure here. That means that he's not going to have a bunch of drones transferring here, which oracles can sometimes pick off your drones, or phoenixes could pick them up and kill them. It also means the drones get to work sooner, which is... a uh, a pretty sizable thing. At this level of play, you need to really min-max the crap out of your macro. So, thinking about if you made a drone here, for example, from the larva, and the rally point from this hatch was set to here, not only is there a chance that it'll get killed, but it also takes time. Like, one, two, three, four, five, like, maybe six seconds to get over there maybe five to six the exact amount doesn't matter but if you say that workers mine at about a rate of one mineral per second that's a handful of minerals that you're not going to have for their two base timing or gas whatever equivalent resource you want to consider there so i think that's a way that he squeezes just a little bit more out of zerg macro it would be small but for every drone it ends up adding up and that's going to make him pretty strong at around the six minute mark that would probably be one of the major differences between like his level of play and my level of play. I usually don't think about those really tiny, the little tiny things that add up. So he's spreading creep. Nebus getting the third up. He's continuing to make probes so that as soon as the third is done, he can just transfer. And he's going to go Twilight and Forge. So this is his way of saying, I'm going to go ground. He's going to go ground off the back of this. He's got a Sentry. Zealot, Adepts. The Lynx kind of go up and look around, but they're generally not going to get that much damage done. Sometimes they can pick off a few workers here between the bases. That's the main pressure point that Speedlings could apply at this phase of the game. 
overall, if you're jamming yourself into a Nexus and trying to get some damage done, it's typically going to be less effective than trying to seize the area between the bases. An exception would be, like, if you do a drop up here. Like, sure, whatever. The army is generally going to be at the newest base. His spore placement is worth looking at. So he's got two spores here. He puts one in the line, kind of more forward, and then one on the front. And then he has one at this base, and then one for the transfer here. This may be a little bit different than some situations, because he scouted the Phoenix so early that Neeb hasn't really committed that hard to it. He made a few and got a little bit of damage, but he didn't go bananas on it. Sometimes Protoss will just go up to like 15 Phoenixes and just zoom around and they'll fly over the base and pick up drones. If that were the case, and if it were surprise Phoenixes earlier on, he may have made additional spores or the placement may have been different. But this is kind of a, a confident spore placement where he's being more assertive in controlling his territory rather than being more defensive. So Hydras have a small window here where they can sometimes get some damage done. The danger though is Zealots are really good against Hydras if they can get on top of them. So this attack just completely fails. There is something to be said about controlling the flow where he forced the warp in cycle to be on the Protoss side of the map, which is better than the warp in cycle being here in the main base from a prism. So that's something positive, but the attack itself kind of just fell flat on its face. Some Banes, Brazelets, that's pretty whatever. So it's a pretty even game overall. Say neither player is exceptionally far ahead or behind. He's going for ranged one, this is after going for melee one. Got some Phoenixes there. So how many drones? Oh, he's going for melee and range at the same time. He has two evos. That's interesting. And Bane speed. He has 75 drones, and Neeb has 74 probes. So both of these players have a really, really good economy. I think most games are not really going to look like this in your typical ladder matches. There are so many different two base all-ins that are in the Protoss playbook. You've got the one base cannon robo stuff. So these types of games will happen, but it's probably going to be kind of rare, especially at most leagues of play. Wow, he has 84 drones. I think he just killed a bunch of stuff. Yeah, he did a Bane run by over here. So he's got this staging area of Ling Bane. He just sends Lings here. And then he morphed about this many and sent him into the worker line. And he's going to do that again. So Hydra Bane, rather than putting all your eggs in one basket and trying to bash the Protoss army, it's usually more about just hammering the probes with Banes, with upgrades. And then using Hydraling Bane on creep to not die. And to take some reasonable trades. Like if you get a good opportunity... Obviously, you would take that, but a thing that a lot of people struggle with when they're trying to play Hydra Bane against Protoss is they'll get all of their beautiful units, and they'll put them all into a single clump, and they'll jam them into some narrow corridor, and then the Protoss just storms and you die. So notice he's not doing that. He's not committing himself to a big fight, like right at the opponent's base in some narrow area. He's forcing the Protoss to divide their units, and making them chase Banelings around, which is really annoying. So this is the proper way to play Hydraling Bane. He's controlling the center with his main army, but he's not overcommitting with it. He's spreading creep with his queens. Notice he has these three queens on a hotkey. It makes it easier to control and to remember to spread creep with them. A lot of times people will just have a bunch of queens and they'll just lose their purpose and just fall asleep for the rest of the game. So having really clear and precise roles of either you're in the army 
or you're injecting bases, or you're spreading creep and defending. It should be one of those. And his ejects aren't perfect. But he's getting a lot of work done with his units offensively. And once you have five bases like this, you have a pretty good amount of larva income. So he's not really in too big a trouble. He's rushing Broodlords here. One of the things that can be really powerful if you're going for Hydra Bane is once you feel like you've dealt a decent amount of damage, rushing that Broodlord transition out. There is a bit of a timing window. If you can get ahead and kill a few probes, let's see how many he's killed. So he's killed 21 probes, that's pretty good. It makes it really hard for Protoss to afford to continue to make Immortal Charge Lot Archon High Templar, to have a Warp Prism active and harassing, and also get the Tempest or Carrier transition up. It's very expensive. So if you're controlling the flow by going for a lot of these Bane run buys into probe lines and stuff, and you're also cooking up that Broodlord switch, it's going to be super effective before the air toss gets too strong. So he's got a decent size of army here. He's got what? 15 hydras, a smattering of lings. And then over here, he has what? Eight hydras and some banes and some lings. So he's got two different arms of his forces and he's kind of punching on both sides. Pretty sweet. Just taking whatever damage he can get. A lot of times people ask about target prioritization of like, should you kill the Archon? Should you kill the Robo? Should you kill the whatever? Generally, it's going to be more opportunistic than that, where you put your units in an area where they have stuff that you can shoot at. And you basically just shoot at whatever is the most available and exposed, rather than trying to pick the absolute best target of what to hit. Like killing the Robo, that could be good, but the Robo has a bunch of HP and shields. So hitting probes is usually the the softer and better target to hit. He has 90 drones. That's amazing. That's one of those things where it's like, don't try this at home. It's just really hard to spend. A lot of these pro gamers are incredibly fast like they're they're fast and knowledgeable at a level that your average enthusiast player they cannot physically do so there's kind of the the way of understanding this game flow without necessarily doing it the same way because you can learn from this but you should think about how this applies to what you can physically accomplish Sure, you could just commit to practicing this and you always try to get for 90 drones with Hydraling Bane. If you want to do that, go for it. You're your own boss. But from what I typically see, spending an income with this many workers is very hard for your average player. So having something more like 70 would be a lot more feasible here. But he's playing against Neeb, and Neeb tends to be a very greedy player where he gets a really high probe count and he makes a lot of army and takes those trades in the big macro game. So this could also be something that is specific to countering Neeb, where he's going for a little bit more income than he normally would against some other Protosses, maybe. And this is a pretty big map too. So for the different maps where you could go for this really big 90 worker Hydraling Bane into Broodlord style, Cerulean Fall is a pretty good map for this. Blue Shift, you might die. You might just die. Big run, Ling run by over here. Notice he has those Lings on a hotkey. Rainer uses the Steel function a whole lot. I'll show you where that is real fast. Menu options, hotkeys, global control groups. So there's the create, there's the select, there's the add. And then there are these versions where you can create a group and take them away from existing groups in the same step. This is really useful for, say you have a bunch of Hydraling Bane, 
you can box a bunch of your lings or just control select them and then steal them to a harassment group and they get a different job they're not with the main army anymore they try to go and attack some other base attack some probes that kind of thing so that's a good thing to do i just fully replaced my add and create buttons with the steel versions i feel like there's not really a downside for that So he's still going Hydraling Bane, and he made six Broodlords. Exactly, oh no, seven. Seven Broodlords. Seven is a pretty common number. It allows you to really pressure the High Templar without over committing you to Broodlords and making your army too slow. One thing that's very annoying, and that happens to me sometimes, is I'll have an awesome amount of money, and it's like, I'm gonna make 15 Broodlords. And I do, and it's fantastic. And then the Protoss just takes their army and just runs around and kills my bases. And I can't recall, because I'm not Protoss. So I'm having to base race when I have a much stronger army and I can't force them to fight me. So having a smaller Broodlord count like this has some upsides on that front. Where you're not committing too much to anti-ground, you're not committing too much to slow units. But it is enough that this is going to really stress out the ground units of Protoss and force some air stuff like Tempest and Carriers. But yeah, he's basically done it here. Neeb is just, he's dying slowly. He is doing Broodlord Micro. His Broodlords are on a separate key. Looks like they're also on the main army key. Tempests. And notice how he charges up the Broodlings and then throws them in, and then he'll often back them up. Broodlords aren't constantly attacking. They have a recharge time between their Broodling strikes. So the Broodlord itself doesn't actually attack. It has an ability where it throws the Broodling on the ground, and the Broodling hits something and deals damage from the Broodling strike. And then the Broodling deals damage has a really fast weapon speed and its damage is pretty good. Let's compare it to a Zergling real fast. So this is 8 damage, weapon speed is 0.35, this is with Adrenal Glands. This one is 7 damage, 0.46. So it's not quite as good as a Ling, but it's pretty close. It's almost a Ling worth of power. 30 HP to 35. Broodling is pretty good and it's free, which is nice. But what you can think about is bringing your Broodlords in so they can throw their Broodling Strike and then backing them up while they're recharging. Because sitting in range of Stalkers or whatever isn't really going to accomplish much. In this case, he's basically just got it in the bag, so... He's just jamming it in there. He has 85 drone economy, it's fine. He can just remake an army. So he's making what? 17 Hydras, 26 Lings, plus one air attack, plus three range attack. Injecting the bases. He's got five Overseers, which is basically his way of saying, please don't make a mothership and snipe my detection and then kill me with a tiny army that's invisible. Yep, and that'll do it with the Remax. GG. Thank you, Rainer. Do you think the exact count of 85 is calculated? I don't think it's precise to the drone. I think it's more of thinking about phases and ranges. So I would agree, that's yeah, probably between 80 and 90. Only three control groups. Yeah, but a lot of times he's changing the jobs of his units and cycling out control groups. So he's trading really aggressively with Banes and Lings and stuff. And his worker count is really high, so he's stealing stuff from his main army to a harassment key and then trading those out. So, yeah, he's able to do a lot of stuff really fast with a small number of control groups because he's cycling the, the units in those groups really fast. Yeah, he is good at this video game. I would say that is a fact. Your diamond brain cannot comprehend 90 drones. It's kind of like 
a hundred drones, except not that much. It's kind of like 80, but it's a bit more. Sweet. Let's take a look at another one. Sometimes you go to a hundred drones and then you realize that you're supposed to also build an army. And it gets really tough. Okay. This is a very different map. Very different map. Super short rush. Super aggressive. But the first three bases have these high ground plateau thingies. So that can be pretty good. Oh no. Is he gonna get it? Okay. He has to go gas pool, which is a pain in the butt. This is a situation that rustles my Jimmy Jim Jims. I just want to expand. But sometimes you can't. You just can't. Okay, now we did. In a standard macro game, how many workers should I have? 70. If you want to play the most standard you can possibly play 70 which is three base saturation in a bit and you need to take your fourth base at like six to eight minutes so you can transfer because the main base starts to mine out at around eight minutes and you want to be able to transfer the drones from the main to the fourth you see like the way the main is mining away right now it's fresh at the moment but in a few minutes it's gonna be drying up. You can just like box half of it, box whatever, and then click the fourth base. So you still have some workers that are harvesting away, but you don't lose any mining efficiency because some of these patches will disappear. And then you lose efficiency. So his third base is a bit later this time. He got hecked up having to go pool first instead of hatch first. Adept is going in. Did he kill anything? He killed one. One drone for an adept. Meh. That's whatever. It's what adds. Okay. So he's got sentry. Nice pick. Nice pick with the lings. He's getting his third. He sees the immortal. He's getting roach and a gas. Cool, I'm droning away. Neeb is a couple workers ahead. This is pretty normal, and it has to do with the relationship between Chrono Boost and Injects. Protoss has a two base power spike because they can hit two base saturation faster than Zerg can, and two base saturation provides more powerful options than it does for Zerg. Zerg really wants those three bases injected with a nice economy where they can max out faster. So a lot of times the Protoss game plan is going to try to evolve leveraging their two base spike against the Zerg to wound them and get their third set up. So he's getting his third. Observer is observing things. So he just went up there and cleared a little bit of creep. That's good. That's good for Protoss. You want to delay that Zerg map presence as much as you can. Notice he skipped spores this time. He's seen sentries and stuff, so he's probably thinking, yeah, it's not going to be DTs. Surely it won't be DTs, because we've seen lots of sentries, right? Yeah, it's totally not going to be DTs. Shit. It's DTs. Oh boy. But the plus side is, he has a lair. And he has 64 workers. And a fourth base. Can he defend this? Because this third base is a meme. It's purely, it's like a joke. It's like an inside joke for Protoss players of like, hey, totally gonna play a macro game, right? And what this often does is the Zerg sees the third base and they're like, okay, I'm gonna drone up to 69 workers. And then do you know what happens? The Zerg dies horribly to a huge attack. And what do we have here? Look at this! It's a huge attack! And Rainer's trying to go for a counter. 
But he built a gateway, and he can defend it with DTs. And he has three immortals, nine zealots, and eight DTs. And the lair is being killed! Oh man. Now he has to make a new lair. Oh man. What a poop scoop. Okay. He's still not making probes. He is resolved to end this game <laughs> with 47 probes. No more, no less. That's it. Lay a creep tumor, queen. You can do it. And then the Ravagers come over here and realize that's a massive army. Yeah, because he's been on two base economy for a very long time. He's dead. He's, he's just dead. That's tough. So what were the three things that caused him to fall by the wayside? The probe hecked up his opening and he had the gas pool, which was never fun. And then, what else? He skipped detection because he saw a bunch of sentries and assumed there were gonna be DTs. So he lost his lair. Which means he lost the ability to make a Hydra Den, which would be really nice right now. And his harassment failed because it didn't have detection, and he defended it with Detease. So he's just dead. And I mean, yeah, he did a big counterattack. Yes, Protoss is on 27 probes, but that's all they need. Oh wait, does he win? I can't remember who wins this. This, th I want to see how many kills this DT has. Okay, it has three. Isn't this amazing? I'm not even mad, I'm amazed. 24 kills on this immortal. Blessed. Oh man. This is just icky. It's the mass ninja attack. That spore is not gonna save you. It's only gonna allow you to see your doom. But you're doomed. Those links aren't gonna change anything. Well, he killed the warp prism. That's good. And if you didn't see this game live, Neeb had to ask for a pause after this so he could go take a shower. I clearly think Toss is Zimba. No. I'm just trying to, to joke and be funny. I was, I was trying to be funny, but sometimes people interpret stuff in the most serious way possible. Protoss is too strong, blah. It's fine. Neeb, he used a creative strategy. And everything that he did was legal and allowed in the boundaries of StarCraft. The races are asymmetrically balanced. Now that's a fancy word. What does that mean? That means that the races are overall balanced but they are successful and powerful in different ways. They don't all have the same tool to solve the same problem in the same way. They have different tools, different infrastructure, different appearance too. They look different. But if it was symmetrically balanced, it would all just be effectively different skins for the same race. But it's not like that, is it? It's different. Have you ever played early game Toss versus Terran? Well, yeah, I'm a full-time streamer. I do it all the time. And I will firmly place my foot upon the floor and say that the game is pretty balanced right now. 
Do you want to know the saddest time for Zergs? The, the most sad time was a, a short period in Legacy of the Void beta when they put in automated injects and you only got two larva per inject. It just makes me nauseous just thinking about it. It was horrible. Two larva. Never again. Never forget. You see, that was actually really imbalanced. Zerg was terrible. It was it was actually unplayable at that point, and I was sad. I was just sad every game. I tried to do two base lurker stuff, but then they nerfed the lurker den, and Zerg could do nothing. But they fixed it, right? Because they noticed, yeah, this is this is hecked up. This is just unacceptable. Zerg is in the dumpster right now. We need to go save it. But in the current state of Legacy of the Void, the game is quite fair. It is extremely fair. And if you lost, and you're in um, some league other than GSL Code S, there's a, a news flash here. It was your heckin' fault in like 67 different ways. And if you really knew the extent of your imperfections in your gameplay, you would be very humble about that loss because you earned it. With supply blocks and idle production time and lack of map awareness, mini map awareness, the injects fallen off, forgot to expand, floating six billion minerals or whatever. Let's face it, we earn our mistake, or we earn our losses with our mistakes. Let's be real, okay? We can joke and we can be silly about, oh yeah, this is super strong, in a joking way. But that's just to take the edge off the sadness of us losing and to just meme about and whatnot. But honestly, if we can be super honest right now, we lose because we are bad and because we mess up. Honesty is hard though, and sometimes it's painful, but it's true. It is by our own badness that we lose games. This is a super standard opening, almost identical to the Cerulean Fall game. But the difference is, instead of going for a second Stargate, Neeb is going for Prism, Twilight, Templar. So it's going to be an Archon drop. Archon drop, and then the golden question here is how many gateways? Because if you go four gateways, you can make two Archons and be annoying. Yeah, he's going to do four gateways and take a third base. So this is the more economical Archon drop opening. There are some more YOLO versions where you go for six gateways or eight gateways before you take the third. And then you try to warp in a ton of stuff. We saw Showtime do that against Lambo. It's a pretty common variation on it. And the way you can tell is the timing of the third. The earlier the third, the less likely they're going to have a ton of gateways and it's just going to be four. But it's still pretty tough to defend. It was nice that he had the queens here to kill it. The queen should focus the prism. They do almost nothing to Archons. So the way you think about defending Prism Harass like that is the Queens hunt the Prism, the Roaches protect the Queens. And you have an Overseer to oversee everything that's going on. So these are the Roaches that were left over. I'm just gonna go kill some stuff before the Immortals are here. And when the Immortals are here, he runs Oh, he focuses down a High Templar. Nice. Nice little micro move there. Focus on some High Templar. Quick fourth base with double gas. That's a cool choice here. And he's going to spend that into Fast Broodlord. Cool. So it's a four base Broodlord with Hydras to not die. Kind of interesting that he's... Okay, I was going to say, it's interesting that he's not killing the rocks, and then he immediately attacks the rocks. Kill the oracle! Almost. This is cool. This is a way to be active in the game with the early game units that are kind of bad, and you don't really care about preserving for your 200 supply max out. So he delays the fourth here. And remember what I said earlier? Around 8 minutes is when the fourth base needs to go down, so... Pretty effective time, he killed the probe that was there in a pylon. Because Rainer knows how this video game works. He knows that Neeb needs to expand. Look at this main base. This happens every time. 
Unless you killed a bunch of workers in the main for some strange reason. Which doesn't normally happen, but it could. Could happen. Could happen in your games. A drones to 71 probes. We're making money. We're making bacon. Bacon. And this space is up. There's no fifth. I kind of feel like here taking this as the fifth might be slightly better. Because he's controlling the center with his army. And there's creep at this space, but there's not creep at this space. And a lot of times Protoss will just warp in a bunch of zealots here. And they'll just run him on this side lane and then attack this, and it's really annoying. He's spining up. Plus two ranged attack from the Evo. Greater Spire is done. And he has eight Corruptors. We're going to kill the Warp Prism, and then turn into Broodlords. Rochandra. Zooming around, Oversight, Overseer, overseeing everything. Nice. So he's trying to pressure with this Roach Hider to buy a little bit of time for the Rude Lord Morph. This is kind of putting Kneeball in. But is putting Kneeball in. Because he really needed a fourth base. So now he's on what is effectively two base economy. A little bit more than two base. He's getting three bases of gas right now. But for his mineral income, it's really messed up. So look. He's super starved for minerals, and Rainer has a huge bank. Because he killed the roach or he killed the fourth base set up with the roaches, and then he killed it again here with the Roach Hydra. So Neeb has more workers, but he has less effective income. Wait, what? Oh, he doesn't because this base died, that's why. Trading out Roach Hydra. It's okay to take slightly bad trades like that, if you're super ahead. And he was already committed and Zerg can't recall, so... They just tried to fight to their dying breath and do something. So he's gonna pull the girls to transfuse. Try to support this push. Hydra Broodlord Queen. I would say is probably the most straightforward and strong composition that Zerg can go for. Like a Hydra Bane, Roach Hydra or Hydra Bane mid game, and then this is a late game. I wouldn't think you would have to change from this very much, regardless of what Protoss goes for. So notice he's doing what I was saying, where you throw the Broodlings and then back up a little bit and then go back in. Did that a couple times. And that's it. And that's the game. Nice job picking off the Prism early on, which gave him a lot of breathing room. He did a snap call fourth base Broodlord push as a response to getting ahead from doing that. Good stuff. The Tempests are doing some work, but not enough. Yep. It was all about that fourth base, though. Well, he got his fourth base and leveraged it really well by taking double gas really fast and then the roaches that denied the fourth base and then the roach hider that denied it again and neeb just couldn't make it into the late game he didn't have the money can you hide the time remaining during the cast i would have to change the Observer overlay. And this isn't precisely a cast, this is more of a investigative study. We're not doing the play-by-play, -play. it's more about grabbing the game flow. Like, I'm, I'm speeding it up through some of this, and we're mainly looking at how the players get ahead, what they do, why it matters, why it's awesome, this and that. Can't you just hit the down arrow? Can you, though?
Dear God, man! Oh, sh nice. Strophium, I treasure you. Did you know that? Did you know that? Can we can we get some uh, some praise in the chat for Strophium? Okay, I'm distracted. Anyways, anyways, there's um yet another standard 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 opening, but. What did the oracle do? What? Wait, what? Was that the adept? The oracle isn't out yet. Yeah, okay. So he killed two probes, and Protoss killed four drones. So one of the things with this is... It, uh, sorry. I can't go forward and back with this. Okay. So there is an interesting choice here that was different from what we've seen in previous games. He made four links instead of two, and he's going across the map with them first, as opposed to using them defensively, which is riskier, but sometimes more risks make for more rewards. What the heck? So let's see what this looks like here. So he has some links here, but he didn't chase the shade. Ah, oh, he didn't chase the shade. There's another adept here. So Neeb has one adept in the natural, one adept in the main. These lings are trying to get some damage, but he's got probes on point. Look at this. Probes surround. Probes surround. Yeah, I mean, wow. He's ahead. Neeb is ahead. He's very ahead. So this is going to make his two base power spike ridiculous. And... Rainer is going to be basically against the ropes for a while. He needs to just survive. He can't really do those big moves like take a fourth with the gases super fast. He would just die. Nice ling spread here so we can see any prism or air units that zoom out. That's cool. Double gas here. Yeah, the macro is a lot messier this game. It's messy. Queens are running around. He's trying to run his lings around. Third base is coming up. And this is the Phoenix meme. And he's not going to see this until Neeb decides to sally out. Oh, there it is. Okay, so now he knows. Injecting this. Taking an Evo at the third. Phoenix has come in, you can't explain that. He does have a second spore here. But the workers lost this game. Ah. And this is a really snowball-y kind of relationship, right? Where because the adepts put Neeb ahead, Rainers had to remake more drones to compensate for the ones that have been lost. And then the Phoenixes show up and he loses more drones. So he's just making drones when he can't really afford to make army as early as he would like to. He's doing a pretty good job of stabilizing, though. He is quite good at this video game. Third base coming up. It's going to be a ground switch again. So from what we've seen from Neeb, at least, the ground transition is what he goes for behind the Phoenixes. In your typical ladder games, you can't really assume that until you see the ground units. Like, if you see Immortals, then you know it's ground. But they could also go for a Fleet Beacon and Carriers or something. If they wanted to. This is a better way of managing Hydra count, right? So the Phoenix is force a Queen Hydra response, and then the High Templar Immortal are pretty good at dealing with large numbers of Hydras. So he's going for plus two melee. Fourth base is up. 82 workers, 69 probes. Cool. Kills the fourth base, that's good. Main base is mining out. Bailings are trying to get some damage. 
Neeb's army has been very intact, and he's banking up a lot of storms, though. And that's the thing with energy units in your army, right? Man, kills the fourth again. Energy units... Your army value isn't going up, but the effective fighting potential of your army is going up. Because you're getting more and more storms as the High Templar are just kept alive. So Neeb's just defended. He's defended. Hmm. Rainer actually looks like he's in a pretty good spot now. Okay, never mind. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. He's in a good spot. Loses all the queens and drones to Phoenix. Okay, he's dead. No, I think he could still... He could still do some good stuff here. That is a ton of banelings. Holy moly. Oh crap. Oh crap. The Banelings are coming in from both sides. Immortals are shooting stuff. Nice force fields. Oh, crap. But there's a lot more stuff over here. Damn, dude. Neeb just won't die. Nope. I will retake my fourth base again. I've always thought that the Banelings should deal splash damage to air when the Phoenixes pick them up. It would make sense, right? I mean, the Phoenix is holding the Bane as it blows up. Why does it not take damage? You know, the real stuff would be if you could load your Banes into a spore and shoot them out like a cannon to hit the air with splash. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. That's the anti-air that Zerg needs. Mothership. So Neeb's just getting up that tech tree. He's getting up there. His worker count has still been passable. It's been fine. It's not like heaps like Raynor has, but Raynor's just throwing lair tech at him. And now with the mothership and carriers online, it becomes a different beast to deal with. He has plus two attack. These lings are plus two attack. Oh God. Shields level one is done. Workers killed? It's pretty even. Protoss has still killed more. These phoenixes just will not give up. Never give up. Oh. Oh, no. Lings are trying to get in, but the two zealots. Look at this. Wow. Oh, but the banes, no. Run. Okay. Okay. This is tough stuff. What are we chrono boosting right now? Oh, carriers. Okay. That's good. Never a bad call to chrono boost your carriers. Watch me win this. Watch him win this. Oh no, the mothership died. Uh-oh. But Zerg has a lot of bad units here. It's the bubble of hope. Everyone get in. Ling's trying to counterattack. Zealot's defending. Carrier defending. Carrier's attacking. This is a scary Brothas army. And there are tons of storms too. Oh man, Raider is just dead. He's dead. Storms. Storm the interceptors. Storm the Archon. Storm everything. Wow. Oh man. But then he storms again. Oh wait, is Rainer gonna hold? Is he? But the Archons and the Zealots Oh, that was really close. 
Wow. Now, Zerg is dead. Wow. Plus two, and they have shields. Two more carriers showing up. I love this. It's like winning with like a dozen units in the late game. It was just that close of a fight. Picking up the queen just for fun. Just for fun. Like, what is a queen going to do anyway? Attacking. <laughs> Attacking against this. Incredible. The overlords are here just for ceremony. To congratulate the Protoss on their victory. That was hardcore. That was hardcore parkour. He did fall behind. I think he he made a really good close game of it. Bashing the, the bases and stuff. But Neeb was moving that tech along. He sure was. He just he just kept trucking. Get those carriers and the mothership out. The mothership was kind of a whoopsie daisy. It just died way ahead of the army. Oops. Oops. Okay. Shh, don't look. What's that button? Okay, don't look. Okay. Okay, now you can look. The final match in this best of five. What a fun best of five. Oops, he misclicked his workers. Blue shift. This is a short rush map. That means all of the attacks hit sooner. And so does the probe. Oops. Both players kind of made it oops in the early game. Bless David Kim. There was no probe block of this 17 hatch. Nave did that all in um, Fracture, and it worked, so why not do it again? I don't know, he decided not to. A little bit more income. The earlier you send the probe, the more income you sacrifice. Well, it's the same amount of income, but income earlier on is more impactful than later on. Here goes the probe, strong and brave. Stealing five dollars, fighting the drone. Queens, oh, he pulled fully off gas this time. That's a little bit different. Overlord, scouts the wall. He's doing the Ling attack again, maybe? Yeah, so he's gonna go around the Adept. Oh, he's doing it with six this time. Interesting. So it's six Lings on offense, and then he's gonna defend with the other ones. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There are lings in the base. Oh man, dude. That sucks. Holy crap. That is... That is an adept that is like right at the door of the gateway. And it's like a... Obi-Wan Kenobi Darth Maul Qui-Gon Jinn like laser field that just... Boosh, right in front of you and you just can't. All you can do is just look out into your base and see the lings killing the probes. Damn, dude. Oh. Upon the edge of a knife, a StarCraft game is played. So, so close. It would have been different. It would have been so different. Seven probes died. So, Raynor is very ahead. He is ahead. He has map control. He has the world. Blue Shift is his. It is the real estate of Raynor and his queens and his creep spread and his spore. Why would you go out on the map? Don't you know? Don't you know who this belongs to now? Okay, Raynor would have to do something spectacular to lose this game. <laughs> this is a like monumental difference in how the last game went and this one. Last game, Neeb was like four to five workers ahead. Zerg is ahead when Protoss should be ahead, which is really bad. It's really bad. So what does Neeb do? An Adept Shade. And then goes home. Hoi oh, yoi. That's a lot of Adepts, but that's even more Lings. Oh, he's going for it. Rainer's just turning on the jets here with Ling Bane. So he has three base mineral with one gas of Ling Bane. Cool. 
This is his way of saying, no, you shall not take a third base. Because I know I'm ahead. And I'm going to use my lead to deny you a third base. There is the danger of Archons, though. I've been in this situation before. And if they can get a bunch of Archons, the links are just paper. They can just punch through it. So he is taking more gases. He's getting a Roach Horan. Macro Hatch, fourth base. Yeah, he has tons of options now. Third base. Oh! Cancelled. So, right now, this is when the fourth base should be going down. Just as a reference for how tough this game has been for Neeb. So, from the initial point where the Lings were harassing and stuff, to the Adept push failing, to... It's just one thing after another, and now he's taking a third base at the fourth base time. Just to give an indication of how bad things are. And it's tough to say what you should do in a situation like that, right? Because if you risk a big move like an Adept Chain, and it pays off, you can catch up or get ahead. But if it fails, you're even further behind. So he went for the risky choice here. And it didn't really work out. So was it the wrong choice? It's tough to say. That adept was very close to finishing. The plus side is Neeb's army is much higher tech. But Rainer has tons of larva and a huge worker lead. So it's Ling Bane Roach Ravager. It's kind of like Hydra Ling Bane, but it's on a tighter budget. He had a pretty low amount of gases for a long time. Ravagers don't require as many upgrades to come online. Ooh, this is a pretty tough push. But there's just so many bugs. So many. There are no upgrades on this Protoss army. The Roach Ravager don't have an upgrade, but the Lings are plus one. And I think there's Roach Speed, if I had to guess. Plus two melee just finished, there is Roach Speed and Bane Speed. Cool. Cool. Yeah, Neeb didn't make more workers, which... Questionable. Questionable, because you could have taken a fourth behind that, right? Not so that he could have a four base economy, but so that he could get a three base economy. Corrosive Bile. I did a Corrosive Bile today and killed a bunch of my own units trying to kill an Overseer. But I still won the game. Ha! <clears throat> Is he going for any transition here? Not really. I think he knows that Neeb is mortally wounded. So transitioning would maybe give Neeb more of a chance? I don't know. I feel like you could plop down a Hydra Den or something. Wouldn't really get punished for that. Broodlord, I think, would be a little bit excessive. Because Neeb's pretty forced all in right now. Roach Ravager. Banes and Archons. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He just has too much stuff. Beating scissors with paper. With Rainer. Good job, dude. He wins the series 3-2. to two. Do you think it's worth practicing cheese for Zerg so you know how to play from it and against it? Sure, if you want to. I mean, there's no, like, one correct way of learning Zerg. If you love cheese, by all means, cheese the ever-loving crap out of every opponent you face for the rest of your career. Or just cheese sometimes, but there is a lot to cheese. There's a lot of decision-making, because the cheese has to adapt to the different stuff that opponents do. Because sometimes you cheese and they're trying to cheese you, and it's a cheese versus cheese. Sometimes they're greedy and you just kill them. Sometimes they're hyper-defensive, and you might need to adjust your play. And if you don't practice your cheese at all, 
you're not really going to be as fast in reacting to that different information that comes in. So, sure. If you want to, yes. <laughs>